I am fortunate to have one of the best jobs in Washington, and I will just really briefly tell you about that uh, and then get to our, our great panel. Um, at CSF, the Commercial Space Flight Federation, we represent about 53 or 54 uh, different commercial venture companies, um, ranging from the full gamut of the, your larger companies like SpaceX and Sierra Nevada Corporation and Virgin Galactic and Planetary Resources, down to Moon Express and XCOR and um, Alaska Spaceport. We have nine spaceports. We have uh, suborbital companies, orbital companies, ground systems, people that are going, um, building vehicles on, uh, to go onto the moon and, and Mars and beyond. We have uh, Bigelow, who uh, they couldn't be here today because they're announcing, they're um, revealing the beam out in, uh, having a big uh, press release with NASA out in uh, Las Vegas. So it has been a fantastic ride for me. I've been here for six months. The first couple months uh, were a little hairy, but it has just been wonderful to get out all across the country to see the different companies we represent from, uh, and each one of these panelists um, have been able to get out to their companies and see what they're doing. And it's real stuff. That's what makes it uh, I exciting. You know, too often we are inundated with uh, PowerPoint slides of, of what we'd like to do, um, but with the three companies you're seeing here today, it's what we can do. Um, let me tell you also why I love this industry. Uh, and why commercial space is good, uh, is how responsive the commercial uh, sector is. And I, as many of you uh, keenly uh, aware folks in the audience may notice uh, we have a substitute today. Uh, that is not Jim Muncy. Uh, There's a, a slight difference for those who know Jim Muncy. Uh, but Barry Matsumori from uh, SpaceX, the senior VP from SpaceX is going to join us today and I'll talk a little bit about uh, Barry in a second, and I'm really tremendously grateful for Barry, literally Barry stepped in uh, about seven minutes ago. So um, th that is, that's how good uh, <laughs> these guys are. We ask and they deliver. Um, and I think their customers are finding that out too. So, uh, so on our panel today, I'm just gonna do a quick overview. Um, here's maybe a little different from how things went today, but I'm gonna do a quick overview of our uh, panelists, our really great panelists that we have. Uh, and they're gonna talk a little bit, maybe about 10, 12 minutes or so, about what they're doing, what their company's doing, what, you know, where they see the industry's going. And then we're, we're just gonna you know, have a discussion. And when you see the wealth of knowledge that we have here, um, I think you, you, you'll appreciate that even more. So first off, Richard uh, Del Bello. Richard uh, just recently joined uh, Virgin Galactic, at Vice President of the Washington Operations, uh, Business Development, Government Relations, whatever the huge umbrella that that, that covers. Rich, uh, previous to that, just came from the White House, from the Office of Science and Technology Policy, uh, where spent a little over a year just doing great things, working the issues, um, and really helping the industry along, which was fantastic. Prior to that, Rich was at Intelsat General, where he was Vice President of Government Relations there. Prior to that, I'm going to miss one, but uh, satellite, he ran the Satellite Industries Association, uh, was the executive director of the uh, SBCA, right, this, uh, Satellite Broadcasters, and what's the C stand for, Communications? Yes. It's communications Association. I'm going off, you know, off the cuff here on this, Rich. Um, and going way back, Rich, uh, in, I think, interned, you know, his sophomore year of high school at the, uh, the Congressional Office of Technology Assessment, OTA. I'm, I'm going way back there now. <laughs> so. They're, they're, uh, they're in the same category as NACA right now. So, um, so uh, Rich goes way back. Peter uh, is from Planetary Resources, joined uh, Planetary Resources in, in 2013 um, with over a decade of national security space, um, uh, space experience. And Peter really, uh, I got to know Peter probably five, seven years ago, maybe longer, when he, he also was at the White House uh, dealing with White House space policy. So the policy, for better or worse, that we're living with today Thanks for that. Yeah. has Peter's <laughs> fingerprints all over it. Um, but, but again, the, the, the transition that these two have made to the White House, from the White House, couldn't be more appropriate um, in their current position today on you know, moving this commercial, uh, commercial sector and the, this enterprise that we have now um, and just wise moves on the part of the, the companies. And lastly, Barry Matsumura, who literally, um, you, you, you would say we called him up from AAA to, to suit up for today, but you know, we're the AAA team and uh, Barry's coming down from the majors to be with us today. Uh, as I said, Barry, Senior Vice President at SpaceX for Business Development. Uh, you can only imagine how encompassing of a job that is. Um, 
and prior to that, Barry came from Qualcomm, uh, or Vice President Qualcomm, and I think he had a, a space background before that at General Dynamics. But uh, really just a fantastic guy. Uh, if you're out in, uh, in Hawthorne, California, Barry will be the, you know, he was one of the first guys to show me, show me around the, the facility and what a facility they have out there at SpaceX. If you want to see the future, it's, it's in Hawthorne. It really is. But it, it's also in Mojave and Seattle, I should add, too. So fair and balanced, just like O'Reilly. And Long Beach. And Long Beach. And Long Beach, and now with the, the, the successful job fair. It's in California, though. Yes. So the West Coast is doing great things. How about that? Um, that's, uh, we, we're going to keep this discussion up. But like I said, really an all-star panel. I'm thrilled that these guys were able to make it. Unfortunately, Jim wasn't able to make it today. Um, but uh, like I said, we're going to have a, a great panel here. So Rich, I think I'm, you're going to kick it off? I'll kick it off. OK. Uh, I think I have some slides. Um, before, before I get started, this is basically an overview of, of what we're doing. But I do want to sort of foot stomp what Eric said, which is what's amazing is what's happening in this industry. Um, there are, we have a great number of companies that uh, uh, Eric mentioned, just to add to the list, I mean, Planet Labs, Planet IQ, Spire, Skybox, NanoRack, Space Flight Services, Blue Origin, Vulcan Aerospace. These are all new, relatively new names and new companies that have come onto the scene and all people who are trying to do something do something that not sit down and do another set of studies about what we might do if we could get funding, but people who set their sights on doing specific programs and getting them done. And it's an incredibly vibrant and, and uh, fascinating group of people, group of individuals and group of companies. Uh, we get, we're out in um, our main manufacturing facilities out in Mojave, but we're opening up a new facility in Long Beach. And we get all kinds of visitors. And we just recently had a group of, of folks from um, uh, Europe come over. I won't give any more information than that so you don't know who they actually are. But, but they were just amazed. I mean, they had been doing the whole West Coast tour. And they were just like, what is going on out here? This is like amazing. I mean, all this incredible uh, churn. And, and shall I, you want me to drive just right? So anyway, enough of that. It's an exciting time. It's an exciting group of people. And what I tell people is even if 50 only 50% of us manage to accomplish anything, we will have let a generation of young people actually build and fly stuff rather than do studies. And I think that is a 100% victory for everybody right there. OK, so just some basic terminology. Um, we are, deal we are uh, building three separate things. The White, we call it the White Knight, the carrier aircraft that's in a far right box. Uh, it will carry both the spaceship and the launcher one. Far on your left is the spaceship, um, uh, which, is the, which is capable of carrying uh, humans to uh, 80 to 100 kilometers to, the, to space. Um, and in the middle is the new product, which is the launcher one, which is a small launch vehicle, which will be launched. Uh, on the White Knight uh, carrier aircraft. So those are the three main products that we're working on. <coughs> we just opened last weekend uh, a new facility for the Launcher One product uh, in Long Beach. Um, uh, brand new facility there, and we'll be, we'll be uh, moving in there, and they're hiring up. So if you know any young aerospace engineers or any old aerospace engineers that, that are looking for work, um, the Virgin website has uh, all the jobs listed, and they're trying to hire like 100 jobs uh, to, to start at this facility. It's kind of funny because this is a community where I think the old Boeing C-17 used, uh, used to be built, and so there's a lot of talent in this community, but uh, the amount of, but the work, the work close by has been, has been kind of tough recently, so it's great. We've got a tremendous response, uh, both politically from the, the California folks, the mayor and the California legislature, and, and also from the local community and all the great uh, workers who are out in California. So as you all know, I think uh, last October we had a very, very bad day. Uh, we lost uh, on a, actually we weren't uh, at the time flying the, the spaceship. It was scaled composites. It was a, a scaled test and a scaled test pilot, but they were flying for us. We've now taken over uh, all of the spaceship both the manufacturing and the test flight, so everything will be virgin uh, going forward. 
But anyway, we are uh, in the process now of building the second uh, tail number of the Spaceship 2 product. It's about, should be, uh, we're looking to be done this summer with the next, uh, with the next iteration of this and hopefully ready to start testing this year, at the end of this year. Um, the NTSB should have their report out um, mid-summer, but the head of the, the chairman of the NTSB at the FAA conference a few weeks ago said that, yeah, and I think it's a direct quote, he said, I don't think any, there's gonna be anything in our report that hasn't already been covered and implemented. So we're not looking forward to any surprises, um, and we're looking forward to getting back to flight. <coughs> In addition to flying people, um, we are also uh, in dialogue with NASA and the research community about flying hardware. There's a capability to uh, kit out the entire um, spaceship so that it can carry uh, about 600 kilograms to 80 to 100 kilometers for about three to four minutes of microgravity. There's surprisingly a lot of interest in that space. Uh, we talked to a lot of people who said, you know, I, I do want to go to station or I do want to go um, uh, in other longer term environments, but I need some limited blocks of time to work on uh, the technologies that I'm doing. So there's a, there, there is, I think, a great deal of interest um, in the suborbital uh, flight community. The next product is the Launcher One. We're just at the beginning of this product. As I think several people, in, including Pam Melroy at lunch, uh, have noted there's a tremendous number of small sats, small payloads, uh, small form science and reconnaissance ideas out there. But the roadblock tends to be there's no low cost, there's no, no low cost, uh, easily accessible uh, launch vehicle. You can fly as a secondary payload uh, on, on the larger launch vehicles. It may not be going exactly where you wanna go. You can go up with Space Station as Planet Labs has been doing, but that orbit is actually much too low for them. And so at some point, there's this tremendous demand building for a, uh, for a launch vehicle that can uh, fly often and fly, fly cheaply. And we've defined cheaply as it should be under $10 million. That's, that's what our goal is, is to build a launch vehicle that can fly for under $10 million. It will be a limited capability um, uh, in the first iteration, probably 150 or so uh, kilograms to uh, 500 nautical miles. So certainly that isn't gonna capture everybody, but I, we, think that there's a, uh, we think there is a robust market uh, in, that, uh, in that region. Uh, so pretty straightforward, we are building a new engine called the Newton 3. We looked around the community for something in the 60,000 pound range and didn't find anything that was affordable. So the team made the decision that they could, they would just build it themselves. So we have our own, I think we have a picture, yeah, we have our own uh, test stands. We have two test stands for the hybrid motor uh, if I could back up one second, the, the spaceship will not use the liquid engine. Uh, the, the Launcher 1 will use the, the LOX RP engine. The spaceship will continue to use the hybrid motor that it has today, uh, which, uh, which uh, is easy to replace, safer, and it involves, since we're only going to 80 to 100 kilometers, much, much, much less energetic regime uh, that, we need to, uh, that we need to meet there. But in any case, we are, um, building our own uh, engine. We have uh, the test facilities already exist in Mojave uh, for doing all the testing. And that is a picture of a full burn of the Newton 1 and we're now working on the Newton 3 and almost ready to start hot fire testing of that engine. And so again, we know that there's a bunch of people who uh, either we have approached or uh, who have approached us and I think you may have uh, we may have discussed earlier, there's a tremendous amount of interest, again, for those of us who lived through the 90s, this is, this is fascinating to see again, there's a tremendous amount of interest in, lo in large constellations of low Earth orbit communication satellites, we can talk about that later as a panel, but, uh, but there's a, a great interest in this weight uh, category. So 
I think I can sum, wrap up there. What we're trying to do with Launcher One is create a low cost vehicle that can be dedicated for fast response. Obviously, it's, since it's air launched, you can do all azimuth launch. You're not limited to a single, to a single launch site and it gives you great flexibility um, at a low cost. So with that, I will be quiet and turn it over to my bigger brother, Barry. So, uh, good afternoon. I think we're going to start with the video first, right? getting ourselves to uh, destinations like International Space Station by ourselves and have that independence. And this is the first step of many steps to take in order that we do take humans much further beyond uh, than LEO uh, and to other destinations. I think it's, it's, it's uh, excellent that we have this opportunity and I'll, I'll mention Boeing. Boeing and ourselves are the two suppliers for this, for this uh, commercial crew effort. And I think it's great that there's two of us. It's important that we have a redundant source of space access for humans and that we continue to do so. I was recently on a panel uh, with a Boeing gentleman and uh, it, the person that was moderating started with the comment, well, we're gonna have a cage match here. And, and then I got up and gave my remarks and said, it is not a cage mac it's match, it's not gonna happen as much as you might wanna see the other gentleman and me fight. Maybe on another topic, but not on this one, because we're complementing each other, and we're complementing uh, the U.S. In, in providing a redundant source of human access. So, so uh, with that, I'm, I'm very pleased that uh, we're on this program. We're making our milestones, as well as Boeing, and uh, we definitely look forward to our first flights. Um, so, start with human space flight, very important. Uh, the next part is, uh, actually, uh, one other comment, and that's, uh, we do have International Space Station until 2024. Uh, that's great. There's some other last-minute resolutions work, but in large part, 2024, we do need a next destination in space, and that's we have about 10 years to work on it, and I think that's going to be a very important goal of what else do we do in space, where else do we go? Can we get activities in on-orbit uh, space processing for various microgravity uh, applications really start in the next 10 years? That's going to be very important. All right, I'll move on and switch to kind of commercial space. And commercial space has also been really interesting. Um, I, I don't think we're the only source, but we're certainly a significant contributor to two things, and that's competition and innovation. And both are important. Competition because uh, I'm, I'm in various forums where I have an international crowd, and 
I look at the crowd and I say, some percent of you are our customers. Thank you very much. We really appreciate you. Some percent of you are not. I would like a personal thank you afterwards, if you don't mind, because I lower the cost of space access for you, or I, uh, SpaceX, the company did, by providing competition. And then I'll address another part of the room and says, some of you that look at the competition coming from SpaceX and looking at us as potentially disruptors, uh, for those of you that are in the innov innovation part of the business, um, I'll also think that maybe you want to come to the side and thank me also, because what you've now got are some, some new projects, uh, some new ideas being focused. Why? Because all of a sudden, your companies are having to rethink Maybe just the way we do it is not good enough and we actually need to improve. And I'm not addressing a large number of companies, uh, just a few competitors, and, and that also is healthy. I think the entire business is, uh, our business is healthy to have competition and innovation take place. I'll temper it with, we are in the business of taking valuable assets, be it humans, uh, be it satellites, be it uh, other assets that are going to space, that many of them are very difficult to replicate. Humans, you cannot, you cannot risk human life. So we all have to be careful. We all have to do the right things to ensure reliability. But, but if you can introduce competition, if you can introduce innovation and, and meet reliability and safety, then that's a good win for all of us. And uh, the last part is um, uh, we are in the middle of working with the US government, in particular the US Air Force. I won't say a lot about it, but I will uh, just mention that we do appreciate the U.S. Air Force. They have been great partners through this exercise. It's been tough on both sides. We've been both working very hard. We hope to get certified soon. But um, yeah, without, without their efforts, uh, this would not have been possible. So uh, that's a personal thank you to them. And I think that's all the remarks I have. Thank you very much. I think there's a slide deck in there. All right, thank you. Um, so thanks, uh, Eric, for putting the panel together, and thanks for having me here today, folks. I appreciate it. Um, I, uh, I have to be nice. We have one of our college interns from Planetary visiting, so Abby, I'll, I'll try to, he's actually got more technical expertise than I do, so if I say anything wrong, just raise your hand back there and tell me I got it wrong, if you don't mind. All right, thanks. Um, so. Um, one thing that I, I want to stress, I think is turning out to be a common theme of this panel, is that um, the, the companies that are here are doing two things. They're, they're changing the game about how space has been done traditionally, but also making space something that is approachable to everybody across, across the globe. Something that is, you know, things that, that are happening at Rich's company, um, mm -hmm. making space something that is personal. Um, the things that, that SpaceX has been doing and, and, and the amount of, of publicity and, the, and the, the excitement in the, in the young community, and, and as Eric pointed out at the beginning, and as Rich mentioned as well, the fact that we have young people turning wrenches and doing things rather than sitting on studies at these companies, I think this is a tremendous value. We've got college interns who are building spacecraft and then going back to school and going and telling their classes, hey, you know, I took a semester off and actually built a spacecraft that's going into space. And that's not something that we have been doing for the past few years in space. So, um, so with that, what I want to do is, is go into a little bit what Planetary Resources is doing. Most of what we get publicity on is about the asteroid mining activity. Um, but I think at the heart what we're trying to do is we, we're just as much as Virgin Galactic and SpaceX have changed the game with launch and with access to space. We're doing the same thing with the in-space part, with spacecraft. So with that, uh, let me just go to the next slide here. Again, this is what we're going after. What we're trying to do is look for resources in outer space to be used in outer space and then also bring back home uh, to be used here on Earth. So as, as Barry mentioned, after station, something else is going to happen. And what we want to be able to do is provide the raw materials to make that happen whether it's fuel or it's metals, to, to provide the infrastructure there to allow those deep space and exploration missions to happen. So a couple of things that we're after, uh, as, you've, as some of you may have heard, we're after platinum group metals. Uh, platinum group metals um, are 
in great abundance in the asteroid belt and on asteroids, not so in great abundance here on Earth. They're heavy, everything's sunk down to the core. The majority of what's found in the crust that we mine is actually left over from meteorite impacts. Uh, and then the vast majority of that is locked up in mines in Russia and South Africa. So for a strategic national resource, not just for us, but for many nations, it's probably not best to be relying on Russia right now. In addition to that, you look at where things are going for uh, use of catalytic converters. It's impossible to build a catalytic converter without a platinum group metal, and we're running out of platinum group metals. So for us, we see a market increasing for a use of those, those materials here. The second part really gets more to what Barry had mentioned in, in his talk, and that is if you're going to get into space, it's going to take a whole lot of fuel. And the way we do satellite operations now is we put all of the fuel on the satellite that it's ever going to use. And it's, it's the same thing as taking a cross-country trip and loading up your car with all the gas it's going to possibly need for that cross-country trip. It just makes no sense whatsoever. So if we can put fuel in space for people to use, you can launch a communication satellite that is mostly transponders by weight. You can do deep space missions where it links up with a, uh, a water depot to provide radiation shielding to the astronauts, provide fuel, provide drinking water. So we think that there is a tremendous market uh, for that in the long term. So what, we're, what we've seen is throughout history there have been processes and things that have opened up new materials uh, and new resources and this is just the next step. And what's interesting is in the speeches I give and you know, Chris Lewicki and other people, Eric Anderson at the company, is that when we talk to the space community, they go, okay, yeah, this is going to be hard. Okay, yeah, we get it, but good luck. When we talk to the mining community, the guys who do offshore drilling, the guys who do deep mining, they go, okay, yeah, this makes a whole heck of a lot of sense. It's actually interesting that the mining community gets this and embraces it more than the traditional space community. But this is what we're, what we're looking at is, there have been innovations in technology that have led to a great abundance and, and exploration of resources. And what we thought we couldn't get to before, we're now able to get to, and, and it's been a game changer. And that's the same thing we're going to do in space. And again, you take, for instance, the example of aluminum. You know, once considered one of the rarest things, and now you wrap your leftovers in it. So this is where I get back into what we're doing to be a game changer in spacecraft development. So you take, and this is probably going to offend some of the Goddard folks here, and I. Well, I don't apologize, just, um, but this is what it is. So you take an old system with 300,000 part count, workforce, one of a kind, spend a lot of years studying it. It has to be completely 100% survivable, so you're going to spend a lot of money on people doing studies on it before you even turn a wrench. And what we've done instead is 3D print something that has laser comms, has 300 part count, and only took 40 guys to do it, and it requires one person to man it from a ground station. Um, and we get our reliability through software and then also through just using, in essence, a swarm of satellites. So if one goes down, one loses productivity, it can be, uh, it can be there, you have a mesh network of capabilities that can enhance the survivability of the entire mission. So uh, one of the questions we get asked often is why are you going after asteroids now? And that answer is uh, to us pretty simple. We're learning more and more about asteroids. From, a, from an energy standpoint, a lot of these asteroids are easier to get to than the moon. Um, and if you look at the asteroids we're going after, uh, with current market value, we've got trillion dollar assets in the asteroid belt. And that's why many of our investors have come on board as they said, okay, we understand there's a risk, we think the technology is there, and the payoff is just too, too good to, to ignore. So right now the company is actually profitable, even though we haven't mined a single asteroid, and the reason for that is that we've been developing key technologies that have uh, our software hardware based. Uh, that we have been working with other, other entities to, to utilize. Um, and part of that here is you look at, we've got LaserCom, IR sensors, our autonomous software and 3D printed systems. Um, almost all of that is being developed completely in-house. Uh, our satellite that will be going up next month uh, was over 90% built in-house and all of our systems in the future will, will have that same type of uh, uh, level of, of uh, in-house build. So as we go through these four areas, what we're doing with them is laser comms, uh, you know, for the, I mean, sorry, for the components and the software, we've got a market there. For our infrared sensors and for our optical sensors, we've got space situational awareness. And just one thing on that, we're doing this commercially for space situational awareness. I spent a long time in government. The government believes it has the corner on space situational awareness. 
I can tell you, having been there, the government has no idea what it's doing with space situational awareness. We have no intention to offer our services to the government because they've said they don't need it. Um, so it's interesting when you tell the government that we don't want business from you, how many phone calls you get. Um, but it's, uh, it's been fun. <laughs> Uh, and then the other thing is, is the, uh, the drones. So we're building very cheap, uh, easily uh, uh, built uh, drone spacecraft, not only for our payloads, but for the use of other people as well. And then of course the big brass ring is the asteroid mining. So this is getting back into the reality of things. Uh, we have a launch coming up in April. We did have a launch last fall. Uh, that launch didn't go so well. I won't name the company, but it rhymes with Schmorbital. And, uh, um, but we rebuilt the spacecraft actually. Abby, how long did it take to rebuild our first spacecraft uh, the, after she went to a fiery Viking funeral? How long did it take to rebuild this one? Okay, yeah, so we rebuilt the whole entire thing in, in about three months and I think it was a total of what, three people working on it part time? Yeah, so, um, so it's, it's, it's pretty good. We've got another launch coming up uh, in October, and then we'll be launching every year after that, doing one or two satellites after that. So things, things are looking good. We're, we're building, we're doing things, and we've got a great core team of folks doing stuff. Um, and what we're looking at here, as you see today, um, again, profitable company doing things. And as we continue to go down the path, this is where we think the company is going to grow into. And uh, it's really exciting for us. I mean, we, we think we're uh, on the cusp of doing something great from a technology standpoint, and then also from just changing society and humankind from being able to bring these resources back and, uh, and provide a, a very serious uh, depleted resource for use here on Earth. Uh, again, just the team. Uh, probably many of you know Eric Anderson and Peter Diamandis. Uh, most of our team is JPL folks. Uh, a lot of the guys built the cars on Mars. Um, probably of note of folks down below, barring the, the ugliest person down there, second from the left. We also have uh, people who come from the automotive industry. Uh, the architect of the I-7 chip handles uh, our software and, and avionics work. Uh, so we've got a good cross-section of folks from, from all over industry. I think we even stole a, couple, stole a couple folks from SpaceX as well, so thank you. Appreciate it. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, we've got a small, small group of guys, 40 people, guys and gals, building things, doing things, getting things done. We've got a great group of investors. Um, Rich probably recognizes the gentleman there in the lower right-hand corner. Great partnerships, 3D systems. That's why we're able to 3D print our satellites. I didn't go into that there, but we're 3D printing the mold lines for those. And then just pouring liquid titanium in there and treating it like it's jewelry. Just crack the mold off and then you've got yourself the, uh, the, the bus. And because of that, we have, I think we have like the greatest number or highest value 3D printers out uh, on the west of the Mississippi. Is that right, Avi? Something like that, I don't know. We got, all I know is that the interns spend a lot of time printing out iPhone cases with the number of 3D printers we've got out there. Um, so they've been a great partner. I don't even wanna know what your iPhone case looks like. So, um, but anyway, so, so that's the company and that's what we're doing. And uh, again, I appreciate being here. And uh, yeah, Eric, turn over you for questions. All right, great, great. Thank you guys for that fantastic overview of the companies, what you guys are doing, um, and the road ahead. Uh, and, and especially, Barry, thank you to you for, I mean, as Rich was speaking, Barry was making that video, which is incredibly <laughs> impressive. You know, the responsiveness of SpaceX right there. Uh, I just wanna, you know, get right into the questions. I, I've got a handful of questions I, I have for these guys, and then I, I'd like, uh, hopefully there'll be a couple from the audience um, that you guys may have for, for this great panel. But uh, one of the, the ones, it was, um, I jotted a couple down, but it really um, illuminated a little bit more after the lunch. Uh, today, the, the lunch speaker, um, uh, Pam Melroy from, from DARPA, uh, she, fantastic overview of what DARPA is doing. But I, I couldn't help but notice that a lot of the things that, that they're doing at DARPA um, look eerily familiar to what the commercial sector was doing. Um, and I know Frank had a, a great question on it. Frank Slater had a great question. Um, is there sufficient coordination and communication between the government and the private sector to kind of ensure that the government R&D and, and the space technology development, uh, that it doesn't overlap with the private sector in a manner that's kind of duplicative? Start off. Yeah, this is uh, always a complicated issue. I mean, the, 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 I think the, traditionally the government contractor relationship was much more, the rules were much more formal than they are today. And I think that what you see in a lot of the, in the programs that Pam talked about, air launch to space, there are two or three companies 
trying to do that. Um, the robotic servicing, there are two or three companies trying to do that. Um, the, so th there's so much going on today that it's almost, I think, harder for the government to say, we want to do this as a government enterprise. And the problem that you get into in, in where we are now in w between the relationship between industry and government is that it's pretty easy for the government to deploy dollars, which turn out to be competition against two or three other folks. So the government actually ends up picking a winner or loser in the competition. And it's a very tough, and I've, and I've been on both sides of this equation, it's very, very uh, tough. And give a personal example, when I was uh, most recently in the White House, you know, we, we got some complaints about our flying payloads to the space station, uh, small CubeSats to the station. And the, and the complaint was, well, you're competing against the small developing launch vehicles. And, and it's a legitimate question, you know. But on the other hand, we were also accelerating the investments in CubeSats and the amounts of technologies that could be done with small sats. So it, 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 it is a problem that I think, if honestly addressed, the government can come to grips with. I think what happens and the negative that often happens is that the institutional imperatives tend to take over where you'll get a government a group or center or organization that says, well, we just want to do this. And then, and then that's problematic because then you're, you are deploying, you're deploying government private, uh, public dollars in, in a marketplace where, where private dollars are also trying to find a foothold. And, and that is a, that's, that's a complicated place to be. I don't, I don't know if we, for SpaceX, I don't know if we really see that conflict. There are definitely some projects taking place on the government side that may, may compete or be in parallel with what SpaceX is doing, but I'm not sure that's affecting us and our commercial activity or, or any support to the US government. Probably the, the only real message is uh, we do like the notion that if the US government sees uh, an opportunity to outsource capabilities, uh, so that private sector can offer it at a cost-effective, reliable, but a cost-effective manner, then I think that's always a great move, and we've certainly been the beneficiary of that. And as the U.S. government continues to do that, I think that's a great thing. Uh, the technology part, uh, it, it may, there may be parallels. Uh, we're certainly working on our own path regardless. And um, quickly, I, I, would, I would just say um, I, I agree, with, agree with both the gentlemen. They, uh, I would just offer a quick anecdote having more to do with the government as a customer of, of things that the commercial side is doing. Um, and that anecdote is, you know, I mentioned the space situational awareness activities that Planetary Resources is doing. Um, I went back to colleagues in the Pentagon and said, we're, we're putting up telescopes in geostationary orbit. The main mission of those is to collect and find asteroids. There will be other times when it's collecting data about other satellites in orbit. We have no use for that. It will end up in the garbage. Would you like it for free because we're going to throw it away? And the answer was no. We don't want it. I have a hard time understanding that. Um, and so it's, I think there's areas where there's competition and then I think there's areas of missed opportunity. And, and maybe missed opportunity is the right answer for both areas where they're competing where they don't need to compete. And then there are areas where there are very cheap solutions for, or zero cost solutions for problems that they have that they just, because of bureaucratic inertia, have no desire to try to grab hold of. If I could uh, jump on that one for a second. What, back when I was working for Intelsat, this was, must have been at least eight, maybe nine years ago, um, there was just then the beginning of the concern of the US government about the, the lack of our ability to see well into geo, activities at geo, to basically understand what was going on in the geo arc. And so we did some quick analysis, and this was, again, eight or nine years ago, and we said to the government, it says, you know, this is, we go to space, all, we go to geo all the time, and our competitors go all the time. We could put east-west looking sensors on our satellites, and, you know, we sort of did some back of the envelope math on what's available in cheap low cost sensors and what you could see and what look angles, and it, it wasn't very long before you could quickly have a comprehensive view of the entire geo arc. The government was absolutely not interested. 
And the reason they weren't interested is they, this is a different problem. The, the, they had no way to talk to us. Yeah. Because everything they were doing was so highly classified. They're just announcing now, just now, like nearly a decade later, that they're going to start putting these capabilities into place. We could have done it a decade ago. And, and the reason, I think my guesstimate why they didn't talk to us is that they are so, these programs are so highly classified that there was no way for them to engage on these topics with a commercial entity. So there are, there are these missed lost, op there are these lost opportunities that result from the radically <coughs> different cultures that exist in the commercial sector and the government. Yeah, I could share my tale of woe from <laughs> 10 years of trying to insert cots into, uh, into the Air Force, but I'll show you the track marks on my back instead. Um, a question, you know, technology question. You know, what technology advancements in, in the launch sector, but, but otherwise, in the coming years, do you think will be the most important um, for the sector in terms of reliability, affordability, access to space, um, and, and what are your companies doing in, the, in this area? I can go. Um, I think there's been a, a reasonable amount of coverage about us uh, taking a first stage and, uh, and recovering it. And I use the term recover because it's really important. Um, we, we do intend to reuse stages at some point. But the first step, first step is to recover it. Uh, why is recovery so important? Uh, and it's actually about reliability and not about, not about cost savings. Um, in our, the effort to recover a stage and then look at that stage and not just look at telemetry to determine what happened to that stage in flight, but to actually know a chamber erosion, uh, the erosion that took place inside a chamber, uh, the, the, uh, the tank and the stresses it actually saw in flight, and do that uh, on the ground post-flight post is a tremendous boon to understanding what happened in space flight. And uh, we all put margins uh, for reliability in our vehicles, uh, and, and those margins will lead to reliability, but this is a much more intelligent path to not only have margin, to actually know what your, your vehicle is doing, that's what automobiles do, that's what airplanes do, and there's no reason that uh, rockets can't do the same thing. So, so recoverability is going to be a very big boon to the industry. And then the, the second part to that, of course, is uh, reusability. And uh, once you have re reusability in play, you can do the simple math of cost per unit reduction in flight by being able to take a piece of the most expensive stage on the entire vehicle and use it X number of times. Um, I, I mean, we're doing a lot of different innovative things in planetary, but I, the one that I think most excites me personally is the, is the additive manufacturing, the 3D printing, the ability for us to literally print the mold line for the toroid tank and not have to worry about the time spent on welding the different pipes and everything in there, not having to worry about others' welds secure or safe. It's all there. It's molded when you pour the, the titanium into the 3D printed mold. And then if you need to make changes or upgrade to it, you just print out a new mold. It's not, I mean, it's what we're able to do on a very quick timeline and on a cheap cost on a repeatable basis is a serious game changer for satellite manufacturing. Uh, and I just highlight on the, the, the uh, kind of revolutionary steps forward that 3D printing is making. You know, the comp there's a small startup company out in, at, in Ames that has been tremendously supported by Pete Warden out there it's called Made in Space. They literally have a 3D printer on the space station and are printing objects that the asteroids, or the, uh, the astronauts, not the asteroids, that the astronauts uh, <laughs> need on a um, daily basis. Um, speaking of asteroids, though, not astronauts, uh, Peter, the, the asteroids bill, mm -hmm. where does that stand? I mean, they, Congress introduced it, I believe, last year. Where does, mm -hmm. it, where does it stand, and, and, um, and what do you, uh, any opinion you may have on it? Yeah, so uh, the clock ran out at the end of last year when the bill was introduced. Uh, we, we believe the bill will be reintroduced here soon. Uh, what I have heard is that there will be a reintroduction of the bill in both the House and the Senate, and that um, it, it looks like we're, you know, since it hopefully will be reintroduced early this year, we'll be on a good glide slope to getting it passed uh, in this uh, 114th Congress. So, you know, it's, it's politics, though. There's one thing I know is you never bet on politics. But, uh, but things look good, really good so far.
Well, then that tees me up perfectly for my next question. Um, as you all know, Congress has been showing a great interest uh, in updating the policies government, governing our companies and the commercial space activities. Uh, what are your individual companies' um, priorities? And, and I, you don't have to go as much as individual, but what do you see as some of the priorities uh, for the industry um, and then general policies that you see need to be updated? Um, as many as you know, they, they started circulating the um, – the Senate started circulating the Commercial Space Launch Act amendment um, last night, uh, I think it came out. So are there any great policy issues in your guys' wheelhouse that, um, that will help or hurt you? Well, I think I would say a couple, not only from Virgin's perspective, but I think for a lot of the, the up-and-coming launch providers is that <clears throat> there's currently a moratorium on regulating um, safety of spaceflight participants, as opposed to third-party safety, uh, safety of people on the ground or people not associated with the launch. The FAA has authority to do that and does that today. Um, so the question is, when you're, and there, there's sort of two flavors of this. There is the part of the market that Virgin's in and then there's the part of the market that my good friend Barry is in where they're launching uh, potentially government civil servants to the space station. So I'll let him address that piece. So for where we are, uh, Congress uh, eight years or so ago uh, said that asked FAA for, to put a moratorium on doing regulation for uh, spaceflight participants and allowing people to fly under what's called an informed consent, consent regime. So in other words, you would fly under the, if you want to go on a canoeing trip or a kayaking trip, you're going to sign a waiver before you get in the canoe or the kayak. It's essentially the same thing. It says, I'm about to engage in a dangerous activity, and I understand that it is a dangerous activity. So it's an entirely different approach than you expect when you step on an airline. When you step on an airline, you expect it's certified this is safe. All I got to worry about is my luggage going to make it and is the internet going to work. So Congress wisely, and th those are words that you don't often hear. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> a little pause there. Put it on. Uh, Congress wa wisely said, okay, let's put a moratorium on this. And if you take a parallel, if we can just sort of shift out of our normal day-to-day -day thinking and just look at the chaos that's going on on, tr on the FAA trying to regulate UAVs. I mean, oh my God, they've been at it for six years and they finally got a draft and it's going to be two or three more years before that draft gets through. It's really, it, it's, it's a really complicated process and part of it is the same logic. How can you regulate something that you don't understand as the regulator? You know, we didn't just magically put all the air flight regulations in place. It, it evolved over a half a century. The same is true here. So number one, we're saying light hand on regulation. Yes, you want to have a heavy hand when it comes to safety of people not involved. Third party, absolutely, you should make sure that, that no one is, is in, none of the public is uh, endangered by any of our activities, absolutely. But in terms of the people who want to do it, this is more like climbing a mountain. This is more like going on a kayaking trip. It's, an, it's going to be an adventure for a while, and that while could, could be a couple generations of of uh, aircraft. And then secondly, is more unique Virgin issue, hybrid uh, vehicles are complicated for the FAA. There's an entire regime set up, again, 50 years of experience on uh, airplanes. And, th and there's a very young regime on rockets. And so when you have uh, a, a system that is an airplane and a rocket, you're constantly talking to do two different parts. Uh, of the regulatory uh, of the FAA and, and those people don't often speak they in the past did not often speak to each other so they had different ideas so it's a very complicated uh, process of getting licensed to go do stuff and so those are two things that we would like to see uh, addressed in, as the Congress goes forward Peter I think Congress is doing a heck of a job Grab <laughs> <laughs> a brownie. Brown. Yes. Um, okay. Uh, just shifting a little bit. What's what's space related um, 
business opportunities do you guys see arising in the next five to ten years? Um, I see, I, I'm guessing that there's some students in, in the back there. What, what, are the, they, uh, what do they have to look forward to in the coming years? Well, I'm certainly hoping one of the things that they're, they're, they're going to see is routine, routine low-cost access to low Earth orbit at a minimum. I mean, I'm totally, um, I, I completely agree. Low-cost access to space makes all the diff difference in the world in terms of uh, making business models work for uh, uh, commercial satellites, uh, any, any of these opportunities, as well as commercializing a LEO and beyond uh, opportunities. So all of that requires reliable, uh, uh, consistent, consi consistently scheduled, uh, repeatable access to space and low cost. And uh, quickly, the only thing I would say is, uh, coming from a DOD background where you would spend decade plus building the system, I think not a particular technology, but I think the thing that, that young people have most look forward to is actually working on hardware and working on spacecraft and, and launch vehicles and turning wrenches and doing something real rather than studying it and writing a paper about it. That, I, I think that would be exciting to me. Actually, I'm going to pick up a cue from where you were at, Peter. Um, I was going to make a comment earlier, but I'll, I'll do it now. So the whole 3D printing bit actually is pretty amazing for a number of reasons, both in, in uh, various poly materials as well as in metals. And we have, a, we have this business. It's called not a huge amount of volume. You know, I used to be in this business. Uh, this is volume. Uh, you do not just millions. You'll do a billion chips, okay? And I used to be in the chip business. And so unit cost has all kinds of opportunities to do things as well as innovation. Our business typically doesn't have those, those numbers of units. And what we all rely on are our vendors for certain things. And we have a big dependency because uh, for many of the components, they have a bigger, bigger uh, customer that has more volume than us. And at best, we're second, third, fourth tier in, in what we are in priority. And so if we're not careful, all of a sudden we'll have some shortage that we can't control. All of a sudden with 3D printing, um, instead of depending 100% on a casting supplier, you print the darn thing in metal. Instead of other parts, you just print it yourself and you cut that dependency. So it's super cool actually that you can do some of that. This being Goddard, I should, I should hasten to say um, the Goddard Symposium and so near the Goddard Space Center that one of the things I hope that the next generation is, is having a great time doing is hopefully some of the, some of the tentative steps we're taking in uh, small satellites in, in addressing the key issues of power, propulsion, and communications on very small satellites. Hopefully there's going to be a whole new generation of people that can do exciting things in planetary research with small satellites. So that they're not waiting for a billion dollar mission to get approved by Congress and take a decade to get gone. I mean, there's some amazing stuff that we've done. I mean, the, uh, I mean, I think that, and Goddard has been involved in some of the most dramatic programs that the space agency has done. But I think in addition to the big programs, wouldn't it be great if there are also a set of very small programs so that graduate students and researchers could actually get to fly within a couple of years to actually do a project and go do real science in the solar system in a couple of years. Um, and if you have low access to space and if you can create small, uh, small satellites that have, again, the right power, communication, propulsion, it, it would be amazing and it would be game changing. So you guys should work on that. In that, in that same vein on what people should work on, Having been at all three of your, your companies, um, wait, we let you in. <laughs> it was Cheese Day at Planetary oh, Resource. Yeah. The, the, the I second after day. I punched my card in, or you know, on the the uh, the access, the, the first thing she said was, "Do you like cheese?" And I and I had no idea what she was talking about. I'm like, "Yeah." And she's like, "Oh, it's Cheese Day," and they had a table longer than this filled with cheese. So the innovation, I should say, of a, a lot of these companies about attracting and keeping the workforce. And that, that's a great point that where I was going with. You, you guys, you, you guys, uh, and I saw, from, all right, let me start over again. You, you just had a, uh, Peter, set, Peter set me up. Uh, um, you guys just had a job fair. 
I, I don't think you're hurting on the amount of applications and, and the excitement to work at, at SpaceX and, and, and certainly the, the excitement and the environment, what's going on up in Seattle right now with, uh, with a lot of the, the new space companies um, that are settling there. Um, what are we doing? I think the, the commercial sector is getting it. But we can't ne neglect, you know, the government sector either as, as a very important thing. And there's got to be a good balance for these uh, young people to look at. Um, what are some of the strategies, the successful strategies, besides Cheese Day um, and, other th and, and building incredibly cool equipment that's going to fly in space? I mean, what are, what are your companies doing in that front? With the st not just STEM, but, I mean, attracting talent. Because it, as I walk the floor, especially SpaceX, I mean, these are not not all aren't all aerospace engineers that are bending the metal and, and building the, the Merlin and, you know, and other things like that. And the same with you uh, on the, the building of uh, Spaceship Two. So um, what, what, how, do you, how do you guys keep attracting? You know, I, having both been at NASA and uh, having had the honor to have been a NASA employee for a while and, and also uh, being in the private sector, I gotta be honest, I think NASA doesn't have any shortage of great resumes either. I mean, I, every, my experience has been that a tremendous, there's a tremendous draw to this whole segment uh, in the marketplace. I mean, Virgin's got a great brand and, and we, certainly, we certainly get a lot of buzz from that, but NASA's got a great brand and they get a tremendous uh, buzz. So whenever, I think what attracts young people is the, um, is the opportunity to work on cool stuff that really makes a difference. And I, I see that actually, it's different. I mean, the, 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 the kinds of people we attract are slightly different, but, but there's, I think, a tremendous attraction to space in general, and I think the, and to NASA and, uh, and our companies in specific. So I actually think we're blessed in that we do attract a lot of the best and brightest into into this whole wacky industry that we're working in. I think I second what you say. It's uh, the draw is the industry and not specific companies. Specific companies have some peculiarities, some traits that are interesting, but the industry itself has to be, has to also be a draw, otherwise people won't come in. The only thing I'd really add is, is um, maybe something different about SpaceX. We do tend to pull from a number of peripheral in industries that are tech and not necessarily aerospace. So if you come around and look at the company, you see some interesting profiles. Uh, one of our one of our most uh, interesting ones is the head of production. The head of production came from BMW Mini. He had no aerospace background prior to that. And so, but what he did understand is how to build a lot of cars. So when we said, well, you need to build 400 rocket engines a year, he said, is that all? Yeah. <laughs> in our in industry, you go, oh my God. So uh, yeah, it's, it's about diversity and draw. What that does is it does bring thought processes into the company that are different than, than what typically the aerospace industry draws itself. Uh, myself, I happened to be in the business a long time ago, but frankly, the last 20, 25 years, I've been in the mobile phone industry, so, uh, which is nothing to do with this industry right now, maybe in the future. But um, anyway, diversity and draw is probably pretty important in your, in your staff. I think they got it. All right. Yeah. Um, I, I don't want to monopolize all the time. Um, I'm sure there's some uh, questions from the audience. Hi, Andy. Hello. Andy Capito from Boeing Company. Uh, question for Barry. First of all, thanks for the terrific ride of our first all-electric satellites two weeks ago. It was an awesome launch. Yeah, yeah thank you very much. I hosted the crowd there. It was great. I uh, want to talk. Can I tell a funny story? Go ahead, go. Okay. So uh, um, the customers are ABS and Yieldsat, okay? And eight, it's a dual stack 702 SB bus. And the customer on top, it's integrated. There's no inter intermediate carrying vessel. Uh, they're stacked on top of each other. And the first customer is ABS. And the second customer on the bottom is Yieldsat. And there's five minutes of time between the first separation and the second separation. And so um, we get. We get the spacecraft uh, into the final orbit, and then I announce, ABS is separated. Half the room goes, yay, and the other half the room is dead silent <laughs> because they're not separated. Five minutes, those five minutes were long. And then, Yudasat is separated. 
yay, and the whole room goes crazy. But those five minutes, boy, it was t torturous <laughs> for you all set. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> Thanks for the great commercial. Yeah. Appreciate it. Um, I have a question about um, the emerging uh, low Earth orbit constellations. Uh, a lot of press about Google and others looking to build a thousand satellite uh, low Earth orbiting constellations, eerily similar to what was attempted by Teledesic. From your perspective, what's going to be the difference this time to make those efforts successful? I'll, I'll, um, I'll probably limit my comments on uh, cer uh, certainly what we're doing. I can talk in general. As a tangent, um, uh, I joined Qualcomm in the early 90s, and I was one of the one of the uh, uh, starters of the Global Star effort at, at, at Qualcomm. We had the terrestrial network, so I have some personal knowledge on some of this. Um, one of the big differences is technology. Technology has gone a long ways since the early 90s, and, and the basis of those constellations. Um, but uh, the other the other thing is in Internet Protocol (IP). Um, Everything will dom IP will dominate everything. That kind of uniform basis of a protocol didn't exist back then. So those those two things are quite different than than in the past. But with that, I think I'll probably limit it at this point. Thank you. Mark, let's get in a time machine and we come to the Goddard Symposium in 20 years, and this same panel is here. Your three enterprises are on it. Who would we be most shocked that was also on the panel with you? P Peter will still look young. Not, not as individuals. Not <laughs> and what would they look? No, but other enterprises would be at the table at a panel in 20 years. And we see it today. Who would we be most shocked that was there? It's a good question. I don't know that I have a profound answer to that. Um, 20 years? That's, that's a long time. Um, My guess is the progress that we're seeing with the commercial companies, I think, are, may, are going to maybe surpass some of the goals that the government has, you know, that NASA has set out for um, in, in, the, in the 2030. Am I right? What is it? 2025, 35, 2035. I, I think we'll be surprisingly further along than than we are than we project to be, and I think it's because. The investor base that wants to do this are very impatient. They, 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 there's a, a matter uh, of, of um, time that they've been cheated out of over the last 40 years on what we've, we've accomplished, and I think they, they see a greater goal, um, and they're not going to adhere to the timetables um, that are set up. They're, they're going to live by their own timetables. So um, I, I, I think we will be further along. I think. Who knows um, what Blue Origin may be doing, you know, in, in 20 years, um, the innovation there. And I, and I think with some of the ideas, you know, with, as Barry was saying about the flyback booster, you know, if we can reduce that cost, I think that the, the possibilities that are going to open up are endless. I think, I think cost, reducing the cost is going to be one of the, the greatest barriers to break. I, I, I guess the only thing to, to add on, the only thing I can add is it's from my prior experience. And we had an adage, you know, we don't worry about the companies that we know about. We worry about the little garage shop that no one knows about that has really smart people. And so the answer to your question is, I don't know, because that's, that's what's going to be there. I, I would probably say that the group we'd be most shocked to see here, but probably will be here, is a senior partner from an all-space law firm talking about all the legal and regulatory activities for on-orbit activity. <laughs> Okay. Final question, uh, David. Okay. Uh, as a as a uh, an educator, what I'd like to to know from you all is what your thoughts are as to what the next generation of students need to do. What we we as as uh, university professors need to do to prepare our students more, both undergraduate and graduate students, for uh, for this new space industry. I'm I'm going to start in a little bit different place. Um, I'd suggest by the time they get to you, it's already too late. I mean, the superstars are known in high school. Uh, they're known actually uh, somewhere in the sophomore year. People, uh, uh, First Robotics, I don't know if any of you follow First Robotics. Uh, all those teams, they know who their superstars on the team are already. And they know who's going to grow to do really interesting things. If I were a recruiter, and by the way, um, 
uh, well, I'll, I'll just say, if I was a recruiter, I'd be going to every space uh, first robotics convention and recruit from there, and and hire early because uh, it's like the NBA, it's like professional sports. Uh, all of the the budding superstar uh, students are are coming up from one of those organizations. There are others. I just point to that particular one because I know it well. But um, yes, we can do things in the university level, but uh, we need a generation. We need those kids really motivated for the sciences much earlier than that. And I'd say in a similar vein, getting involved in real projects that are doing, whether it's through internships or whether it's through actually manufacturing small satellites that are, I mean, getting involved in actually building and doing <coughs> and, not just, and not just studying. I mean, actually hands-on as early as possible to do stuff. Yeah. Um, it's tough for me to say. I mean, I'm far removed from high school and college. The picture in my attic says so. But um, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I hate to do this, but can I put you on the spot, Avi, and maybe just ask you to tell the group, you know, since you're in college and you're an intern at Planetary and you're there now, what kinds of things do you wish you had worked on or what kinds of things do you think were helpful while you were, in, uh, while you're at school? Um, well, personally for me, uh, I'm a co-op at Planetary right now. I'm a junior at the University of Michigan. Um, I think the biggest thing for me is the realization when I came to school was pretty much what you do in class is like night and day different from what real stuff is like. Um, so really trying to almost, I mean, it, it depends on the perspective, but really trying to focus more on learning things by doing, and then the learning almost is secondary. Not that it's unimportant, but that you acknowledge that there's a big difference and that learning on its own from a textbook is not sufficient like some of the people up there said, to work on projects and do hands-on things as much as you can. Just, I'll take the moderator's prerogative uh, for the last, last word. Um, easy answer, field trips. It, it's about field trips, you know, like I, I've got a nine, eight, nine, and a five-year-old at home, and I try, you know, take them down, to, we took the, uh, the Orion launch or SpaceX launch or, or you know, I tried to take the boys to the shuttle launch. Didn't work out so well, but they met Buzz Aldrin. I mean, it, it just, you take, expose them to as much as you can and the hands-on things. And, and go to these companies. Their doors are wide open. If you're in California, go to the SpaceX factory, you know, or see, see what they're doing in Mojave. I mean, it's phenomenal what's come, going come, on. Come to Cheese Day. In, in Mojave, or, or you know, <laughs> get a sampling up in uh, Seattle, what they're doing. But get out there and see it. Um, and that's, you know, that's what's really going to latch on to people, and, and, and you're going to see that desire. But man, if you can, go to a launch. That, that, that's pretty inspiring.